Welcome to This Week in the PNFL. I'm your host, Mark Hill, and uh, we have a normal booth again uh, with Mitch Grawl and Dean Chambers. How you doing, guys? Very good. Good. All right. All right. All right. So we have week one in the books and uh, some interesting games. There was a bunch of trash talking going along, but hey, there were some very good games, some close ones. Um, uh, I think for the most part, the games were pretty much uh, close as I'm looking at this. Maybe two possessions, um, no major blowouts, but uh yeah, I think it was a good start to the week um, or to the season. I definitely want to thank Mitch for handling the games on Twitch. So if you guys missed out on it, you might want to jump into it for week two. It's a pretty much an open forum. Uh, and we just sit there and just shoot the breeze and watch the games. So um, let's gonna go ahead and jump into these games. And then we're going to have our middle segment as usual. And then we're going to go ahead and talk about the upcoming games for week two. So starting off our first game on the list is the newly uh, moved uh, Kansas city chiefs that are now the Houston Oilers. Um, They were hosting new England and they ended up taking this game 17 to three Dean you're up. Yeah, I had predicted an upset in this game, and it looked like it was a fairly low-scoring game, even though it was a two-touchdown margin. A total of 30 first downs between the two teams, so they either played some very good defense or they didn't uh, quite perform so well on offense, including seven net rushing yardage for the Patriots, um, and 111 in anemic amount of passing for Houston. So that led to a thir- a seventeen to three game, and uh, I predicted the upset. And um, apparently, uh, the Patriots are pretty solid on on defense, as both teams obviously were. But uh, they didn't uh, didn't do too well in the offense. So it's hard to win, and as I know from my own team, it's hard to win when your offense underproduces and underscores. Because no matter how good your defense plays, you still have to score to win. Yep. Mitch, how yeah, how well, how the fans know, in Houston treating you already? Ah, uh, well, uh, <laughs> they seem to be all right as long as they, you know, as long as you keep winning, everybody's happy. No, uh, it was uh, it was a fun game. I um, a few things that I learned uh, from this uh, from this past week is one is that it's always good to prepare uh, on your special teams. Hence, uh, why I was able to get a punt block or touchdown so that was always fun Uh, the other thing is is that regardless of um, who my kicker is or if uh, where my home stadium is uh, i still can't kick a field goal Uh, i missed uh, two field goals in this game and uh, of course uh, you know anything over 40 yards apparently it's just my team uh, i i don't make so uh, regular inside outside uh, storms, clear weather, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that was aggravating. But um, overall, felt good about the performance. Definitely need to tighten up a few things uh, on the offensive side. Um, but, um, you know, uh, my my star running back had 24 yards on three carries before he got uh, knocked out of the game. So I'm going to have to figure out how to overcome that for the next few weeks. But uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll want to keep that defense rolling, though. Really like the defense this week. And ironically, your former place kicker is now on the Patriots and kicked a field goal for them, but it was only 33 yards, and he used to make 33s for you as well. But Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, anything over 40, you know. Your guy was here with Jacksonville and New England last season. Uh, New England. Yeah, I, th- I thought some one of them was saying, you know, good luck with this guy because he used to miss field goals for me, and he went one for three for you. So, well, he uh, said that. Well, uh, Mox kept saying that he always had his kicks blocked, which that wasn't my problem. That was still Mox's problem this week, though. So. Okay. Next game we have the New York Jets hosting Jacksonville, 
as uh, Dean would like to mock me and say the Jets do what the Jets do, as um, Jacksonville kept the game close, um, but in the end, uh, the Jets had to come back to pull it off, winning 28-24. to Mitch. No, the uh, Jacksonville dominated this game uh, in, in the first half. I know that this was something that the the group uh, that we were watching this uh, together uh, commented on is that you know, Jacksonville came out swinging and uh, had a you know pretty pretty nice lead uh, in the first half, and, and and then the turnover started happening. Um, the Jordan Love, that even though a, a solid first half, uh, just I don't know, just kind of fell under um, in the under the jet spell. Three uh, interceptions really uh, uh, gave um, gave the Jets uh, some short fields, and uh, Jacksonville wasn't able uh, to recover. But um, you know, Jacksonville, if they can put two halves together like that first half they had. Uh, they're going to be trouble for some teams this year. Mm. Yes, indeed. Um, they are most definitely Dean. What do you got? Yeah, I think I, I think I picked the Jets to win, but not cover the spread here. And, uh, that turned out to be the case. Jacksonville played them pretty tough, but yeah, I think those three turnovers really, really did them in. And I know there's been a lot of instability at quarterback in Jacksonville as it has been at many teams that really, I guess there's only really a handful of teams in the PNFL that are like, have a solid starter. They've been sticking with for a while, so that's true of a lot of teams. And um, the completion percentage, 66% for Jordan Love was good for Jordan Love. But those three interceptions, that um, was very costly and probably cost them the game. And I'm not sure if that's going to work going forward if he continues to throw a lot of interceptions. But, you know, I don't know what their options are. Otherwise, you know, they may be – we may see more so-called quarterback controversy in Jacksonville. I guess we'll have to stay tuned. Yeah. Next game, we have Denver. Uh, where did Denver? Denver moved from um, L.A.? New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah, New Orleans. Orleans. Okay. Moved from New Orleans up to Denver, and they took on Las Vegas. And uh, Vegas ruined their home opener by beating Denver 23-20. to 20. Dean. Yeah, this was a battle between our newest coach and I think the next newest coach in Las Vegas. And it was also a battle of, of uh, a, a rookie quarterback, C.J. Stroud, and uh, the, uh, I think, rookie one or two years before that was boosted was uh, in San Francisco, traded to um, – Traded to Detroit, we then traded him to Las Vegas. So we had a battle of young quarterbacks and fairly recently joined coaches. And uh, I guess that little bit of experience helped. I think Denver made a good showing. They were tough. I think I think uh, this new owner in Denver will will have a respectable first season for a rookie head coach in the PNFL. And uh, this is a close game. And, uh, you know, the – it was really statistically fairly close, but those two interceptions by the rookie quarterback probably didn't help, although Las Vegas had won and um, pretty pretty good game overall. All right. Next one up, we have Seattle. Oh, wait. Uh, hmm? I, you you that skipped me, uh, Mark. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Go back. Yeah. Go back. Yeah. Mitch. Yeah, well, uh, I get for the group that watched this live, it was kind of a uh-oh uh, kind of moment as we're watching, uh, you know, the new Denver uh, coaching staff uh, get out to early uh, lead, but then kind of fell apart. Uh, we even made some comments about how, you know, Las Vegas usually – you know, loses the second half, but this time they actually were able to win uh, the second half. But I will just point out to, you know, uh, the player of the game, quarterback Christian Gonzalez. I know that was a player that a lot of uh, teams coveted 
uh, and if I'm not mistaken, was the uh, number one overall pick uh, in, in the draft, uh, or at least the top three. So uh, I think number one. So it uh, looks like uh, Gonzalez is off to a good start for Las Vegas. Yes, definitely. So I do apologize. Oh, and by the way, yeah. uh, the Las Vegas kicker, McCrane, I drafted him, I think, in the seventh round four or five seasons ago. Uh, back when we still had the salary cap, and uh, I decided after his contract went up, oh, I'll just let him go because he wasn't rated all that high, and he was three for three uh, in field goals. So I probably should have just kept the lower. Yeah, rate. you should have kept what him. Do? What do you do? What do you kept do? Him. Yep. Put a put a uh, you know put a tag on him or something. I mean, yeah. I don't think he well, I got the guy. Well, I got the guy uh, that was at Washington who had much higher ratings, uh, but uh, apparently, uh, you know, apparently he has the uh, choke hidden rating or something. I I don't know. You got to close the roof on the dome. I get last. Well, it didn't matter this week either. Yeah. <laughs> so, All right. Now yeah. the next game we have. Uh, Seattle taking on Washington, and um, I will say they put up a good fight. But you know what? There's um, I'm not taking it as a moral victory. But uh, Washington spoiled the home opener up in Seattle by taking this one twenty four to twenty one at the end. Mitch, well, you know, um, typically when a team is minus two in the turnovers, that's usually not. Very good. However, for Washington, uh, it ended up not uh, not mattering. Uh, they were still able to win. Uh, you know, it was close though, and I will say that Seattle's defense was up up for the challenge uh, with those three turn or three interceptions, uh, and um, you know, it really helped um, keep the um, Washington from really getting any big plays. I mean, I think that was was probably the big thing there, but. Um, Washington still was able to squeak uh, squeak out a you know victory uh, even uh, in out of the mouth of defeat. So uh, you know, way to go, Washington! All right, Ding. Yeah, the the rushing totals of these two teams are fairly even at both eighty seven and ninety two. Um, Wilson kind of, I would say, underperformed a little bit in. In the passing game with only 50% completion on his passes. And throwing an interception as well, which didn't help. Um, Murray threw three interceptions, but uh, you know that that could have been that could have been the difference here. Washington was also a little bit better at third down efficiency, and they converted two fourth downs as well. So when there's seven of sixteen on third downs and you add in those two fourth down conversions, that's like being nine of sixteen. So that helped them sustain some drives as well. So um, I think probably what uh, the coaching staff in Seattle is looking at is improving the passing game a bit and getting a bit more efficient in completing passes and moving the ball downfield. And that would, that would have made the difference in this game. You know, with those three interceptions by Washington, this, this game was definitely winnable. And I'm sure they're very disappointed not to come out with a win here because this was doable. Well, also, too, I look at, um, you know, I lost uh, Alex Kappa. He's out for nine weeks. So um, I think that was when the floodgates opened up and the sack machine started again because um, he lost that number two guard, and that's a, that's a big hole that's going to have to be filled going forward. So um, I think that that was definitely one of the major issues as well. Uh, anyway, that was only one week. Moving on. Next game we have... L.A. hosting Philly that used to be Detroit. So, um, and Philly ended up taking this one 33 to 31. Dean. Yeah, this was my lead pipe lock last week, and I was expecting L.A. to win. And it looked like they were in line to do that, but Philly kind of, Stage a rally late in the game and came back and won. And statistically, it's pretty close. The score is pretty close. And uh, they, the visiting team spoiled another home over here and uh, and pulled off the upset win. Um, we'll see what Philadelphia does in the next few weeks. They have some tough opponents, but uh, 
they certainly can't be uh, counted out. They may uh, win a number of these games and then uh, have a more favorable schedule later on in the season. So they have a shot at making the postseason. So we'll see. All right. Mitch. Well, this had to, this is probably the most exciting game of, of the weekend. Uh, L.A. got up to a 17 to nothing lead. And it was, ugh, it was like, man, alive. Um, Philadelphia is uh, they're continuing that uh, slide like they had in the end of last year. And then uh, all of a sudden, you had some special teams plays kick in. You had some goofy, uh, you know, offensive uh, plays kick in. And next thing you know, um, you know, Philadelphia, the final drive, uh, you know, uh, hits, uh, you know, our, 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 I think it was our uh, famous, you know, that uh, 50-yard lob play uh, ties the game up. And, uh, you know, 31-31, you think, all right, no time on the clock. We're just going to kick the extra point. Oh, no, Philadelphia goes for two. And uh, I think uh, probably converted it by the uh, edge of the, or the nose of the football and got the victory. So I'm confident that Steve is probably threw some stuff across the room. But uh, I know James was excited. It's probably going to relook at his uh, PAT uh, logic at the end of the game. But uh, you never know with James. He's always got something up his sleeve. Yeah, definitely. Next game, we have the New York Giants hosting Dean's Atlanta Falcons and the Giants are starting off on a good foot by taking this one 17 to 14 Mitch. Well, you know, statistically, I mean, Atlanta looked like, you know, if you just look at the stats, looks like that they just walked all over uh, New York, you know, with the 320 yards passing 129 yards rushing. They've got the number one, um, offense as far as yards gained uh, here in the PNFL to, to start with. Um, but all of that uh, movement did not put a lot of points on the board. You know, New York was able to play tough, uh, you know, in the red zone down uh, or at least, you know, in that uh, defensive half of the field. And, um, you know, I kept, uh, kept it laid off the board and then late came back and, uh, you know, was able to uh, you know get some late scores in the fourth quarter to uh, to eat, uh, squeak out the the win. Um, of course, you know, uh, field goals uh, was not on Atlanta's side. They were 0 for 2. So uh, I think Dean and I combined were 1 for 5 this week in field goals. And uh, you know, uh, we're we're not getting a lot of help from our uh, kicking team. But uh, I don't know, Dean. What 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 did you think about the game? Yeah, too many missed opportunities on offense. I mean, there were, there were the two missed field goals that you mentioned. There was a goal line stance where uh, I don't remember the actual yard position. It was a first and goal and I think a, a passing attempt and a few running attempts, including even going forward on fourth down, all were stopped by the Giants' defense. So there's, there's a touchdown that could have been scored. There's two field goals. That's at least 13 points worth of missed opportunities right there. And uh, – you know, some maybe a few other possibilities of scoring, you know, so the offense moved the ball but didn't score. You know, late in the game, it was 14 to 10, you know, and it laid a lead. At that point, my defense had given up 10 points, and with the way the defense was playing, it certainly looked better. The defense was making some stops and containing some plays. The defense was much improved over last season, and that's a lot of what I worked on in the off season. But uh, the the offense missed opportunities, underperformed at times. Thirteen points at least that were missed. I mean, this game could easily be twenty-seven to seventeen. And you know, if this game if this game was twenty-seven to seventeen or even twenty-four to seventeen, you'd say the score maybe looks like it's in line with those stats. So uh, it's one of those situations you you know you do. I wouldn't say everything, but you do a lot of what you need to do except win the game. Yeah, that was a that was a tough loss. Tough loss. Uh, but hey, like Mitch says, it's only one week. So 
Got 15 left. Next one we have Indianapolis taking on San Francisco, and Indy takes this one 20 to 14. Dean. Yeah, this looks more like what I expected. I'd called Indianapolis to win this game. Chicago, I mean, uh, San Francisco can be pretty tough at times, but I think the Colts are going to be improved this season. I think they're continuing to make improvement. And uh, the 49ers punting eight times, that's pretty tough to win when you punt eight times. I'm not sure how they scored two touchdowns in the meantime to come all those 14 points, but eight, eight punts is a lot of – that's most of your possessions in a game, and that's probably the biggest stat that stands out right here in this game. You know, that I guess the 49ers are lucky they didn't get blown out in this game because they punted eight times and Indianapolis only punted five times. Right. Mitch. Well, I'm just curious. Does the name Jerome Ford ring the bell to anybody on the phone? Oh, yeah. He was on my team. Yeah, Yeah, he was the. uh, I saw I noticed. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Ninth overall pick in the I think the 2041 draft uh, got cut by uh, Seattle in the offseason gets picked up by uh, Indianapolis, and lo and behold, averages 11 yards a carry uh, and a touchdown to help lead the Colts to a victory over the commissioner. And uh, I tell you what, I don't know, man. Maybe we should have Maybe you should have kept Ford over uh, Metcalf. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know, Mark. I don't uh, know. Yeah, true. But, uh, but, uh, but no, uh, I think Indianapolis uh, – yeah, the, the second half of last season, if I remember correctly, um, I'm going to say they went on a little bit of a streak. Kind of fell off right there those last two weeks, but prior to that, had a streak going. I think Indianapolis is going to be good again uh, this year, back to their playoff form of a couple of years ago. Um, and I think this is just the start. So um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right. <clears throat> So, uh, who do we have next here? Uh, San Francisco Indy. Um, okay. How about that Chicago-Minnesota game? Yes, I'm going to move on over to that one right now. I'm just sliding my screen down a little bit so I can get their stats. All right, next one that we have up here is Chicago against Mitch's um, – Favorite uh-huh. team besides his favorite own favorite NFC team. Man. Yeah, his favorite, favorite NFC, NFC team, team uh, Minnesota right. Vikings. Um, I think this one was pretty much, uh, you know, I guess our barn burner of the day, going back and forth scoring. But in the end, Minnesota just ran out of gas as Chicago took this one, thirty-eight to twenty-nine. Mitch, you're up. Well, I mean, this one uh, not quite uh, the the. Uh, the nail biter that the uh, Philadelphia Los Angeles game was, but this was an entertaining game. Um, you know, the score 38, 29, I mean, Barney will tell you Chicago probably, you know, you know, probably won't you know, beat him a little bit worse than that. I think at one point um, in, in the second half, uh, Chicago had a 17 uh, point lead, but Minnesota did get some uh, late score to pull it a little tighter, but um I know that uh, we had a good time watching uh, this game uh, on the um, on the live cast on on Discord, and and I would say that uh, Chicago continued to what they did last year, and that was a much more balanced uh, offense. Uh, you know, ran the ball for nearly 200, passed the ball for nearly 200, uh, and uh, even though Minnesota lost the game. Uh, Drew Locke was able to win player of the week for the entire league because uh, he was able to throw four touchdown passes, which uh, anytime you throw four touchdowns against Chicago, uh, you know, regardless of the score, hey, you did something good. So um, I'm confident that Minnesota will uh, learn from this one and uh, still be uh, a terror in the NFC West. Yeah. Dean, what do you got? I think, this game was, I think this game was a bit closer than the score indicates. Minnesota played very tough. I think maybe the difference here was that uh, 
that um, one, I noticed that Chicago played some pretty good coverage and that kind of contained Minnesota's offense, although it was fairly effective in ultimately scoring 29 points. And um, the, and, and at the same time, um, I think a little bit more effective defense by Minnesota, especially in containing some of those toss sweeps that Chicago was running, could have made the difference and allowed them to pull off an upset in this game. They, they you know, Minnesota played tough, and this game was again closer than the score indicates. So I think a uh, little work on focusing on stopping those toss sweeps a bit more. Now that that weakness has been exposed. Other teams are probably going to try to do that against Minnesota, and I'm sure their defensive coaches will be looking to uh, close that gap and uh, address that in the coming weeks because they certainly don't want to lose games because teams are going to just call a bunch of toss sweeps on them like that. Yeah. I don't like watching those toss sweeps. That was a good game. Anywho. Last game that we have for week one, I think I kind of strung it out a little bit too far uh, for a segment, but that's all right. Um, we have Pittsburgh hosting Green Bay. Now, where did and where did Green Bay move from? That was okay. Anaheim. 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 That's right. Uh, so they went in to buy you an atlas. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Uh, hey, look! I was trying to trying to focus on my team, so that was my my little deal. So, but uh, Green Bay went into Pittsburgh, put up a good fight, but came up just a bit short as Pittsburgh took this one twenty seven to sixteen. Dean, yeah, and your team didn't move despite the calls by some for you to move your team, and there was even ridiculous talk about me moving my team to Dallas, which will never happen ever. Not in a million years. But, you know, this game, this is uh, Pittsburgh was hosting Minnesota's rival, the Green Bay Packers. And, uh, you know, I think Green Bay played fairly tough, but they didn't quite play tough enough. And uh, Pittsburgh, the Steelers are a bit more effective on on offense and had pretty good balanced offense and uh, ran for 70 yards. Well, both teams had 70 yards rushing. But, and, uh, well, under three yards per carry in both teams, so their run defenses were pretty good, but the passing defenses allowed the others to score, and uh, Pittsburgh passed a bit more with Trevor Lawrence throwing the ball, almost 300 yards passing, decent com- completion percentage, and no interceptions. So that often helps, and uh, Pittsburgh won at home, and, you know, we'll – Pittsburgh has been kind of up and down. You know, we, we predict they win and they lose. We predict they're going to lose and they win. And, you know, let's see what they do this year. But, you know, they play in tough division with even with the the new, you know, the new team in Denver. But uh, we'll see what they do this season. Yeah, sometimes we're not quite sure what we're going to get. Mitch, what you got? Yeah, this was, this was a, a, again, another fun game to watch with the group. Uh, I know the uh, coaching staff for Green Bay was uh, aggravated for how long it took for them to score a touchdown in this game. <laughs> but uh, uh, a few comments uh, throughout the game by uh, by the by the Green Bay coaching staff. But uh, this is one here where, you know, it, it, you it, it, if you really get into the weeds with stats and the impact certain things have on, on games, this is this is one you could do a little bit of a. Um, the case study on, and I'll make it really quick here. But if you look at, you know, the the passing stats, running stats for for each team, uh, you know, both had 28 passing attempts. Uh, Green Bay had 28 rushing attempts uh, versus the 24 for Pittsburgh. But still, that's pretty much in line. Um, running stats, you know, Dean hit it. They both had 70 yards rushing, which was under three yards of carry, so neither team really got anything going on the ground. But when you look at those passing stats, like I said, both teams had 28 attempts. Um, uh, Green Bay completed 19 versus 16 for um, for Pittsburgh. But the difference was is that the 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 passes that Pittsburgh were completing were down the field. 
of 16 completions yielded 293 yards, where the 19 completions for um, Green Bay only yielded 240. So I think uh, right now you look at the QBRs and all that thing, I think uh, the Green Bay quarterback is going to, you know, have, look good. And, you know, it is a good game for them. But in the teams that get the ball down the field consistently are the ones that tend to be the ones that score. And in this case here, it led to 27 points uh, for Pittsburgh. So uh, I, I, I predict Pittsburgh, uh, I think I shared this uh, before the season started, minimum uh, eight wins uh, for Pittsburgh. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll minimum eight wins. So we'll see, um, we'll see if they can live up to that. All right. All right. So we definitely went long on week one. Um, going through the games, but hey, we got through them. So we're going to go ahead and jump over into our middle topic. Our middle segment um, was a discussion to uh, that's something that uh, Dean brought up and let him touch on that a little bit more. Uh, it was regards to the past middle plays and there was some commentary I think um, on either the forum or it was in the WhatsApp or league program uh, for communications and um uh, Dean wanted to talk on it a little bit more and then uh, try to see if we can pull some uh, insight out from Mitch as well. So um, we're going to go ahead and let you take over on this one and lead us into this one, Dean. Yeah, it originated with uh, something that was posted on the forum. <clears throat> and it was the idea that um, that the first two receivers on medium passing plays should go at least, you know, should run patterns that are at least 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. And I know some people say, well, you know, medium passing, it should be just be that simple. They should run 10 yards. And I said, as always, not so fast, my friend, because there's a couple issues here. And I posted some examples of plays that I've designed on, on the forum in response to that, because in my mind, a, a medium pass play is a play that on average gets more than 10 yards. The key is on average. And also, what I showed as an example, when, when we're doing, um, you know, check receiver pass plays, the issue when you're designing plays is the way that you have to have your, have your receivers run patterns in order to get your quarterback to actually check those receivers and throw the ball to them. Because if the quarterback doesn't throw the ball to a receiver, it doesn't matter if he runs 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage or – 50 yards behind, beyond the, the line of scrimmage or anything in between. You have to get your quarterback to throw the ball to the receiver before before the receiver can catch it. And and when you find when you're designing plays that the length of the pattern and how far the receiver runs and how quickly you want the quarterback to throw the, throw the ball, depending on whether you use one fake or two fakes or whatever, there's a lot of issues that come into play there. And even on medium pass plays, as I showed you in those examples, many of those plays – the at least the white receiver, the first receiver checked, doesn't necessarily go 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. But even in that pattern, that player can still go seven or eight yards beyond the line of scrimmage, catch the pass, and run after the catch. Or in some instances, although the, it's drawn up seven or eight yards beyond the line of scrimmage, that player may run 11 to 12 yards and catch the ball and still be beyond. So I argue against having such a hard and fast rule for that reason. But there's also another reason. The style of medium pass plays that you play, whether you're <clears throat> whether you're aiming for a more wide open aggressive offense mm-hmm. or you're aiming for a more conservative offense, if you're if you're creating medium what are legitimately medium pass plays for a more conservative style of <laughs> offense, you aren't necessarily running your first or second receiver a full ten yards before they check, you know, check for pass and, and catch the pass. Because one of the things you want to consider in that style of play is, yes, you still want to average, keyword is average, you still want to average 10 yards per completion on a uh, a medium pass play, but you want a higher completion percentage. So if you're creating medium passing plays for a fairly balanced and more conservative style of passing game, um, you're looking to get somewhere between 60 to 70 completion percentage and still average over 10 yards per pass. Not medium. I know some coaches would prefer when they call medium passes. And if I'm pursuing that kind of game plan, then that's what I will put in my game plan that week. We'll prefer players, plays that are 
you know, like 15 to 17 yards per per catch. But those are inevitably, unless you're playing very bad defenses or very bad pass defense, those are going to be a bit lower in in completion percentage. So it, it, the reason why I'm against that kind of rule in this instance is that it unnecessarily, I understand we have rules for realism's sake, and obviously we address things like AI busters and other issues of those sorts in our rules. But one, I think we can sometimes get to the point where we're, we have too many rules in general. Also, I think this is an unnecessary rule, and it also is also a restriction. It's handcuffing styles of play. Now, I've been critical of the zone rules. I know, I know we need zone rules to an extent, and they keep someone from sending five wide receivers down the field 50 yards and calling it a short pass. Obviously, that's not a short pass. So I'm not in favor of that, and I'm not in favor of that being allowed. The one thing that I have advocated consistently with regard to the zone rules, or it says it, for example, on medium pass plays, that the uh, the first two receivers can go no more than 20 yards down the field on a medium pass play, and on a short play they can only go 10 yards. Those are maximums. The first two receivers on a short play, I think on a short play, if I were what I would advocate, and I know there's some that disagree with this, I would advocate that a short passing play have two two receivers that only go 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage, but it doesn't have to be the first two that are checked. Because again, if you're running like a true spread offense or air raid offense, something aggressive like that, you could have four receivers in a short pass play and the first two checked go deep and the third and fourth stay within the 10 yard zone in order for the quarterback to throw to them if the deep guys don't get open. And I've tested this in the, in, in the play editor and tested it in games, it works a little bit differently than if the, but anyway, the issue there, and that's why I think a rule like that could usually be changed. And I'll probably present that debate again in the off season, not at this time, obviously we're in a season is again, that's, that's a rule that I think unnecessarily handcuffs certain styles of play. There's certain styles in, you know, for shooting for realism, there are teams that run short passing plays where they check the first two guys, going deep and then the third and fourth are going to be the ones that stay within 10, 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So a rule that prohibits that style of play, I don't think that would be unrealistic because that gets used in real life football. It, it unnecessarily handcuffs um, styles of play. And that's why I don't think we should have a minimum on the zone rules. I mean, the, we have the maximum and I think we should have that to some degree other than that one issue that I mentioned, but I don't think we should also go and say that on a medium pass play, the first two receivers have to stay within 20 yards, but then they have to be at least 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. So now you can't run shorter, you can't run longer. I think that's too overly restricting coaching. And when I say coaching, I mean creating plays and being creative and creating styles of plays I, that, you know, coaches prefer. That's the whole idea of custom plays, that you create plays that fit a style of coaching that you're trying to pursue in those plays. And I think if we handcuff coaches with too many unnecessary rules on play design, which I believe this one is and it should be stopped and it should not be put into our rules, um, I think it. I think we're going to ultimately stifle play design and you're probably going to see fewer people creating, creating plays. And I think it will also reduce, as I said in the forum, reduce the effectiveness of medium passing. Now, there's one other issue, issue I want to mention here. The idea was that we would add this rule and all the current plays would be grandfathered in. I think that's a mistake, too, because when you add a new rule and then say all the old plays get to basically be illegal and not comply with the new rule, it stifles the creation of new plays because then you have new plays that won't be as effective as the ones that were grandfathered in. And yet people say, well, I can't create new plays to do with these old ones. Too. I'm going to continue using the old ones. So the old plays will continue to clog the the play pool, and that will be an impediment to innovation and new play design. So I think it's kind of a cop-out to say, well, we should have a new rule, but then all the old plays get to be in violation of the new rule. I think going forward, if we're going to change rules, it should only be when absolutely necessary, like addressing AI busing issues or things like that, not something like this, which would handcuff coaching. But also when a new rule goes into place, 
I think we should do like what we did a couple seasons ago where we cleaned up some of those plays that were in violation of the new rules. All the old plays should comply with the rules. That way, all of the plays are consistently operating under the same rules. That's another issue that I wanted to raise in the context of this. Um, and it should also be kind of a disincentive to make unnecessary rules, knowing that any time we add a new rule on play design, all the plays in the play, playbook should have to comply with that. At least that's what I believe. All right, Mitch, that was a long one. So, Mitch, wake up. What do you got? No, oh, man, sorry. Uh, yeah, no. Um, hey, he was, Gene, he know, was, like, hey, he was thorough and very detailed. So, well, nothing against God, Dean. Dean was yeah. very detailed in this. Good, good take on that. Good, good analysis. Well, it, it was interesting. Yeah. Um, I think there were some uh, some interesting arguments and some some valid points to consider. Um, I I would lean more personally to having, you know, if you're going to have you know, plays considered short, medium, long, that the primary receiver, you know, be within what we would consider medium, which I think the rule or the consensus has been about 10 yards. That's where I'd fall. And I know based on what Dean was saying, is that if we're if we you know if we go by what Dean said and saying well you know we should you know categorize the play by the average yards it gains ten plus yards per game versus the you know the the I guess the uh, routes that the receivers run you know I've I, I've and I've mentioned this before on the forums I've I've taken our play pool and narrowed it down to what I consider that kind of the top one hundred plays of each play category and. You know, just out of the, and I'm just looking at right here uh, of just the pass short left. So not all the pass shorts, but pass short lefts. I've got 108 plays that I leverage in my personal play pool. 28 of them average over 10 yards um, uh, per per completion, um, and they average, you know, probably, you know, it, you know, I. I uh, in, in each one at 10 yards of completion. Uh, and then on an individual basis, those same 28 plays, you know, are anywhere from about, you know, 50% up to, you know, 75% as far as the completion percentage. And so it makes me think, would we then, if we were to adopt this, need to convert these and say these are all past medium plays now um, based on that logic? I mean, I wouldn't think so because a lot of these, the, primary receivers are all running short routes but there are secondary receivers that are running fly patterns or other things that you know when it's the right situations and the right defenses suddenly those plays uh do have explosive plays some more than others and so i, I think it's something definitely to look at and and you know have some more conversation on uh definitely not you know uh, 48 hours before the first game, but you know maybe, maybe you know I think uh, let's continue the conversation, um, you know as the season goes on. Yeah, and I would say two quick points on that too. Some of those plays that you mentioned, I think um, if you go back and look at those and and probably talk to the people that designed them and there may be a few of mine in there. I mean the the intent in designing those is they intended them to be short short passing plays and and they comply with the current rules on short passing plays and that the first two receivers don't go more than 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage. So I think we need to make sure that we have a, a degree of respect for, you know, coaching style and coaching preferences. And in, in, in the case of, one, the, the coach that's designing the play, and two, the coach that's using the play and how they use them in their game plan. And I think one of the things I'm going to ask you if this issue does come up in the coming offseason is, also, and I, I know this is kind of a question that Jerry will often ask when a new proposal comes up. What problem are we trying to solve here? I don't think there's any problem here that we're trying to solve. And sometimes some of these ideas are kind of like a an idea that's a solution that's in search of a problem. Well, there's no problem here. We have we have diversity and a variety of different styles of play in both short and medium categories, and we're defining them right now. And I think whether or not it affects the primary receiver of the third and fourth, which is the issue that I mentioned earlier, we should just generally stick with that idea that 
a short pass play is one where two players do not go more than 10 yards beyond the line of scrimmage, and a medium pass play is where two of those receivers don't go 20 yards. And I think as long as we're sticking with that, we as coaches that are play creators will operate within those parameters and create plays that are short and medium. And, again, when you're creating a play, it's, it's results-oriented. I test plays and I see what the numbers are. What kind of play am I creating? Do I want to – if I'm creating a short pass play, do I create one that's – going to average seven yards for a completion and I'm trying to get, get up to like 80% completion rate? Or do I create something that's going to be maybe closer to 60% completion and average 10 yards per completion, like some of those plays that you do? And, you know, there are different ways to do that. And so for me, when I'm creating a certain type of play, other than sometimes when I create a play and test it and see how it works, and when I see how it works, sometimes I'll adjust accordingly. If I have a play that's like 58% completions and 10.2 yards, you know, do I try to get that 58 up to 65 or 70 and at the expense of how much of the yards for completion, or do I try to keep it around 55 to 60 and try to increase the yards for completion a bit to try to improve the play? So when we're creating plays, I think the rules as they are now, at least we shouldn't further handicap, coach, handicap coaches in, in that play creation process than we already do. And like I said, I don't see a problem here that that kind of rule would be solving. If someone says there are too many pass medium plays that, you know, maybe have short short patterns or don't always result in as many yards per catch, that's a coaching preference. Don't use those plays. Do use the ones that have a longer yards per catch average on them. So that's – I don't think we need a rule there. We just need what we have, and that is each individual coach and in running their team – chooses which of the available place to use. That's ultimately the solution. Hmm. Okay. I think we pretty much uh actually we need to put a pin on that one right now. We went way long on that one. But very good um very good details, very good information on that one. Um I think we're all good with that one. So as we pivot over to our week two games, um, I would say we have some good um, contests coming up. And from looking at the schedule, um, I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, well, as we go through this and run through it, we will uh, – Discuss it a little bit further. As you guys know, we all have our own lead pipe locks. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Game number one. Excuse me. We have Denver hosting the New York Jets. They are giving the Jets 13 and a half. Mitch. I'm going to take the Jets in this game. Uh, I don't think our new coach is ready for prime time yet. Okay. Dean. I think our new coach might be ready for prime time, but I don't think he's ready for Jets time. So I think the Jets will win and cover. All right. Same here. Going for the Jets. Next game, we have Chicago hosting Indy. They are also giving 13 and a half to Chicago. Dean. Yeah, that, that'd be a two touchdown win by Chicago. I think Indianapolis will play this game tough, but you know that that Chicago offense can put up some points and they can, they can run the ball pretty well, especially if they're going to run those sweeps again and they can hit some deep passes and make some big plays. So yeah, I see Chicago winning by 14 in this one. Okay. Uh, Mitch. I'll take Chicago. Um, I think Indianapolis is going to have a good season, but I think Chicago will win this game. All right. I'm taking Chicago on this one as well. Uh, next one's our first pick em game of the season. And this is Seattle hosting New England. Um, and we are going to start off with Mitch. All right, you can put this one down as the lead pipe lock. Uh, this is going to be a no-brainer. In fact, I think this uh, team is going to win by double digits. Uh, and I'm taking the home team, taking Seattle. Okay. 
Dean. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're going to see an upset here as well, and I don't know if it's considered an upset, but what's the, what's the spread on this game? Anyway? To pick them. Oh well, yeah, there's no spread. Yeah, the home team is is definitely going to win. Uh, that was that was a tough loss last week for the Seahawks, and they're going to rebound and get that passing in going a little more effectively and keep running the ball pretty well. And um, yeah, I'm not sure it's going to be double digits. It, that's possible. It's certainly possible, but I think I think Seattle's going to win. Okay. Next one we have Atlanta hosting Jacksonville. That's our second pick 'em. We're going to start this one with Mitch again. Yeah, um, I tell you, I'm watching the games last week. I know this person won't believe it, but I'm taking Jacksonville. Oh, okay. Dean, there's no, there's well, no it's... love, there's no love for you in the booth today. <laughs> yes, that's an interesting pick, but it it is what it is. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, I think the home team is going to just like your team rebound from a tough loss last week and uh, put together some good defense and manage to move the ball and possibly put the put the football in the end zone a couple of times if we're lucky and pull off a, a home win here against an improving and pretty hot Jacksonville team that played the Jets tough last week. Okay. Um, uh, both teams played well. Both teams lost. Um uh, I'm going to go with Atlanta. I'll split the baby this week. I'll go with the home team since the pick up, uh, pick them game will give the home team a slight edge. Uh, next game, we have Philadelphia hosting Houston. They are giving Houston nine and a half. Dean. Yeah, I think this is game is going to be closer. And despite the trash talk from someone who was saying, oh, this should be like a 29-point spread in favor of Houston. Now, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. This is going to be a close game. I think Houston will win, but it will not be by nine and a half. That spread will not be covered. All right. Mitch. Philadelphia doesn't have a chance in this game. James doesn't want my smoke. He knows better than that. I'm taking Houston. <laughs> Okay, I'll keep it short and simple, Houston. Uh, next one, we have Las Vegas hosting the Chargers. They are giving the Chargers six and a half. Mitch. Uh, this is, I, I think this is going to be a very entertaining game. Um, I, you know what? Um, I'm going to take Las Vegas in this one. I'm going to change up. We're going to take it Las Vegas. Okay. Dean. I'm going to see you and raise you on that bet. I'm not only taking the Raiders to win at home, I'm putting a lead pipe lock on it. Mm. Wow. Okay. Um, I got faith in you out there, out west, Steve, going with the Chargers. Going with the Chargers. I think he's going to pull this one off on the road. Next one is our final pick em for the week. We have the New York Giants hosting Pittsburgh. <clears throat> Dean. Yeah, I think this is going to be a close, tough game. And and uh, I think the home team is going to uh, you got to win against a good Pittsburgh team here. And it could be as little as one or two points. I could see like a a 24 to 22 kind of game and the giants are going to have a, a two and start. They've done that before. They're going to do that this season and uh, win this game. All right, Mitch. Uh, the, the AFC West is not going to lose to the AFC East. Pittsburgh's going to win this by four or more. Okay. I'm going to go with Pitt also. I can't go against the Steelers. I just can't. 
Uh, next game we have, uh, finally come down to the final two, actually. Uh, we have San Francisco hosting Minnesota. They are given Minnesota six and a half. Mitch, do you have your pom poms in a uh, cheerleading outfit? Oh, on? man. I'm over here. I'm doing the skull clap uh, over here. But uh, I think Minnesota is going to win this. It'll be double digit. All right. Dean. Yeah, I'm on board with rooting for the Purple Dinosaur this week. It's uh, it's probably going to be at least a touchdown. San Francisco is going to try to run their beloved toss sweeps, and the Minnesota defense is going to be ready to stop that. Minnesota defense is going to stymie Joe Burrow as well. Um, Minnesota by at least a touchdown. All right. Uh, I was going to go with the skull and then, you know, that Mitch suggested and then Dean suggested the Barney. So I might as well go ahead and throw Prince in there also. So uh, I'm going to go with Minnesota as well. And I am so crazy, Mark. That's right. Let's go crazy. I'm going crazy with a lead pipe lock on this one. So I'm pushing my chips in this week with Minnesota. Last game. And I think they win this game. They're going to be partying like it's 1999. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah, the pigs flies when doves cry. Yeah, there you go. Last game that we have uh, for week two is Washington hosting Green Bay. They are giving Washington ten and a half. Dean. Well, with the way Washington played last week. And Green Bay has a lot to prove here. I'm calling for the upset. The Packers are going to upset Washington in their stadium. All right. Mitch. You know, I was kind of thinking that same thing. Uh, whether it'll happen or not, you know, who knows. But kind of, I got a feeling Green Bay this week. So I'm going with Green Bay, too. I have to agree with you. Uh, I think that uh, Green Bay is going to look at some of the things that I did that were right and hopefully discard the things I did wrong. And I think that's going to equate to an upset. So I'm going to go with Green Bay this week as well. You know, Mitch, we supposedly disagree on a lot of things. We're dis- we're agreeing on quite a few things in these picks this week. Hey, yeah. yeah. You know, well, hey, we don't always wear the uh, opposite glasses. Yeah. Well, hey, it's a start. Baby steps. Baby steps. Of course, right. now that all three of us have picked Green Bay, you know Washington's going to win by 24. Right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. So, All right. So we uh, ran this one uh, not as long as we normally would, but we're still on par. So uh, we're coming to wrap this up. I think this season uh, is off to a good start. Um and I think this coming week's games will be rather uh, probably another round of interesting games as well uh, as the guys kind of get more settled in and starting to scout their opponents a little bit more. So before we sign off, we're going to run the tables one more time. Dean. I'll just say good luck to everyone in their games this weekend. All right. Mitch. Yeah, hey, uh, I mentioned as we're going through the games from last week that, you know, we had a lot of fun um, doing the kind of the watch party for some of the games. Ten, we, we typically had between five to six coaches in at you know, different times uh, throughout the weekend. And so probably we'll run uh, a Friday night watch party uh, late in the evening if we have any games ready to play that night. So I uh, would look forward to having uh, – as many of you all that can to join if uh, we have some games ready to play late Friday night. So other than that, Mark, let's get it. 